So, what do you think? What do you think when you think about our world? When you watch the news at 10 o'clock at night or whenever you watch it, when you hear it, what do you think? Do you think our world, do you think it's unstable? Do you worry about the escalating conflict in Israel at the moment, Palestine and Israel? In fact, when I think about it, it's been a news item, I think, for pretty much every decade that I can remember. There's been a fight in that area. Not just then, but uh, most of the Old Testament too, actually, if, you, if you've read through the Bible. Just to be clear, the Old Testament isn't also part of my lifetime. <laughs> Thought I'd better get that in. So our world, is it unstable? In a, in a climate of, of world superpowers, of, of wars, of rumours of wars, Ezra is going to show us it's not Joe Biden. It's not Vladimir Putin. It's not actually any human who is in ultimate control. This time last year, we were starting in the book of James. James, lots of low-hanging fruit when it comes to living our lives today. Do you remember that? You know, talked about gossiping, use of our tongues, the damage we can cause with that. We looked at how our lives should match the faith that we're professing. What's the point of saying we're a Christian if it doesn't look like we're Christians. Obvious to see in James, in what we read, the text applies to our lives. Direct application, brilliant. Well here we are a year on and we're delving into some Old Testament history. This is the history of God's people. Now if the word history has immediately sent a shiver down your spine, trust me, this is brilliant. It is equally as brilliant as James. Understanding the whole of God's big plan hugely, hugely enriches our understanding of God. The New Testament, Matthew's Gospel, remember we spent the best part of two and a half years actually in Matthew, apart from odd little breaks for James. That is all better understood if we have something of a grasp of God's acting in and through his people from the very beginning of time. We will understand the New Testament better if we understand the Old Testament. It enriches your and my love of God's saving plan that actually reaches that glorious high point at the cross of Jesus Christ. So if we want to understand the cross work of Christ, we need to understand the unfolding plan through the pages of the Old Testament. Now, like most things of, of value, you know that phrase, they need extra effort. They don't come as easily. It's not as easy as Matthew or James. We're going to, to have to work if we're to let God's glorious history inspire us. Let it inspire our understanding of the great God who controls that history. See, we're going to see his plan of salvation, it is much greater than, than just you and me, little old us, in lose now. We are part of such a big picture. And this Old Testament history is going to help us to see that big picture. So I really do want us to work as we look at Ezra and then Nehemiah. They, they kind of go together. Honestly, you could read through Ezra in less than an hour. So if you've got an hour this week, just read it through. If you've ever been involved in a building project, you'll be nodding along with the familiar, familiar issues. So we're not necessarily going to go home every Sunday. Do you know that kind of, oh yes, I got so much out of that. It's not that kind of a thing. But it's an accumulative building up as you begin to understand more and more, or maybe cement your understanding of what God has done through history. What is his big picture? Writer Graham Goldsworthy does, a, he does great overviews of books and how the Old Testament and the New Testament link together so powerfully. And he says this, Show me a church that neglects the teaching of the Old Testament, and I'll show you a church that has a very poor understanding of the Gospel. I wonder if you've ever seen that link, seen things linked in that way, but he's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Friends, to understand Jesus, you and I need Ezra. We need Ezra. So, before we get to our reading, let me do one of those you know, previously on 
Teletubbies or whatever it is you watch, Country File or whatever else you like to watch. So in your notice sheet, you should have been given one of these sheets. What you need to do now is open it out. I was very diligent to say to the welcome team, make sure everyone gets one of these because you need it in front of you at this point. You can see there is no way I could have put that on the screen and you'd still be able to read it. So, if you can have that open on your knee, that would be fantastic. Maybe stick it up at home somewhere where you can study it. I don't know what you do while you're shoveling in your frosties in the morning. You sit there reading the back of the packet, what the ingredients are. You read them yesterday and the day before and the day, but you just have to read something. Why not stick this on the back of your frosties packet? And then you'll be reading Old Testament history every single morning. You'll soon pick it up. Or perhaps the back of your loo door, but somewhere where you're going to see it for a while. So, really, how do we get to Jesus? Why is Matthew chapter 1? Such a perfect start to the New Testament. Do you remember we said that years ago? Brilliant start. Why? Why? Here's why. It's all about God's salvation of humankind in history. Okay? So the Old Testament, if you like, is the promise of it. The New Testament, the fulfilment of it. So you're looking down the right-hand side of your sheet. That's the sweep. That, if you like, is what's going on spiritually. The big picture, what's God doing through all of history? The history that, that I've put down the left-hand edge, that timeline you see running down the left. So down the left, what we see is, is the ups and downs of God's people. We'll see their political kingdoms coming and going. Down the right, though, nothing changes. Their earthly strength might come and go, that says nothing about the spiritual reality. God is still at work. God's plan never thwarted by what's happening on earth, by what's happening on the left. It's all part of his plan. And in the middle, I've narrated the Old Testament. Obviously, it's a little bit of rich, by the way, to do that. So, let's, let's, let's get going. God creates the world, right at the top, at the left. Adam and Eve, they reject God's rule on behalf of all of us. Then we see the consequences, the pandemonium as a result unfolding. God raises up Abraham and Sarah, the forefathers of, of God's people Israel. He promises Abraham that he'll be the father of a nation. One little problem, he's fairly geriatric into bus pass territory and they've not had any kids at that point. Anyway, not an issue for God. His plan not thwarted. They do have a child, I think they're in their 90s, and they give birth to Isaac. With wife Rebecca, Isaac has Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Rachel have that son Joseph, among many other sons. You remember the story of Joseph? Maybe you've gone to see the musical, the fancy designer coats, and the dreams that weren't so popular with his siblings. He ends up in slavery in Egypt because uh, his brothers dislike him for obvious reasons. Well, Joseph gives really wise advice to the Pharaoh and ends up as Prime Minister of Egypt because he predicts some famine is coming and the need to store grain in years of plenty to eat when there's a famine. Well, Joseph patches things up, the beef with his brothers, and they all move over to Egypt so they don't starve to death in this famine. And from that point on, the descendants of Abraham grew and grew and grew in number. The promise God made to Abraham fulfilled. This geriatric, childless couple were indeed now the father of a vast nation. Only that vast nation wasn't living in their promised land, God had, had, had said to them. But they're, they're, they're in slavery in Egypt, not ideal. New Pharaoh, new Egypt, not happy with, uh, with the, 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 the number of, of the Israelites that are there. He decides on infanticide to quell the numbers. Moses' mum, brilliant idea, she does put Moses in the Nile where the other lads were going, only she puts him in a little boat. The boat bobs along, arrives at, at Pharaoh's palace. Pharaoh's daughter pops him out, says, oh, Dad, can I keep the baby? And guess what? Pharaoh employs Moses. Mum pays her to look after her own son. You can't make it up, can you? God is clearly having a laugh at that point. The most unlikely means to bring his plan about, you see. 
If we ever doubt God, doubt he's working, doubt he can, the Old Testament history shouts back at us, are you kidding? Look at what I've done. Look at what God did. He does <coughs> remarkable things and with incredible panache, actually. Anyway, Moses ends up as God's agent to rescue God's people from slavery. You'll remember the ten plagues, parting of the Red Sea, do you remember that? And their escape. Honestly, if you've not seen the animated film, The Prince of Egypt, you're probably thinking that's for the kids. It is, I mean, I know I say I cry at everything. That, is, that makes me cry. It is a brilliant, brilliant film. If you've not seen it, please do watch it. It's definitely worth watching. Anyway. God's people, they get out of Egypt, they escape, they're in the desert for 40 years because of their, their constant disloyalty to God. They're grumbling about everything he does for them. They want to be back in slavery, for goodness sake. Anyway, eventually they enter the promised land. Remember, uh, they they, God told them it would be theirs. Remember Jericho's walls coming down, the trumpet blowing, whoosh, in they go. Now, we looked at Judges a few years back. Do you remember that chequered history, to say the least? The judges, some good, some bad, then you've got the kings. Mostly it's marked by, by God's people's utter disloyalty to their God and God's constant grace and mercy to them. Eventually he's going to say, enough is enough. Your constant faithlessness, I need to discipline you. I need to show you that it matters. So these range of kings come and go. Do you remember you've got David, David of and Goliath fame. He becomes king and Israel at that point is on a high. His son Solomon builds the temple in Jerusalem and that is, is Israel's political kingdom really going strong. But as I say, throughout that, their loyalty to God is mostly questionable. Their prophets warn them that God will eventually respond. They will be overthrown. There will be an invasion of a superpower bigger than them. They're not faithful to the, the covenant God had made with them, and he will punish them. So the, the nation gets split. If you look down there, you've got the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. So it gets split Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Immediately that happens. Their political might has vanished, has it? They're weakened by it. It's a sort of civil disagreement over taxes, actually, that caused it. So what happens? They're invaded by Assyria, 72 BC. Israel goes into exile. Then the new superpower, Babylon, that invades the southern kingdom, Judah, 597, and then again in 586 BC. This is just history. These are just facts. The Judeans are taken from their homes in Jerusalem, and the temple is destroyed and the people are taken from Judah to live in Babylon. That's what the superpowers did at the time. When they conquered a nation, they would take the people from the nation, put them somewhere else, and take people from that nation they conquered and put them there. If you mingle people up, it reduces their ability to, to sort of rebel against you. So that's what they did. They end up under this, this king, scattered, politically powerless, in exile under Nebuchadnezzar. King of Babylon. Those of a certain age will remember there is, um, there is a classic Boney M song by the rivers of Babylon. Who would ever have thought that Old Testament history could be turned into a pop song? But there you are, they managed it. Although I don't know if you've, have you heard the latest um, Coldplay song. Have you listened to the words of that? Yeah. Really interesting, really interesting. So there we are, God's people in exile in Babylon, now under a new superpower, Persia. As always, the superpowers come and go, don't they? I want you to imagine that you're a slave in Persia. You're longing, you're longing to be back home in Jerusalem. Longing to be worshipping your God in the temple in Jerusalem, thousands of miles away. You might have wondered how on earth you could ever get home again. How, how could you ever be free? Maybe a coup. Maybe a coup would do it. And you escape somehow, get through the airport before the customs are shut down. It's unlikely. Maybe someone poisons King Cyrus, and in the ensuing chaos, you jump on the back of a bus heading across the border to freedom. Unlikely. No need. God has an extraordinary plan, a plan so crazy 
you couldn't have believed in your wildest imagination this is how God's going to do it. No way would you have thought this was the way that God would orchestrate your freedom. Even though Prophet Jeremiah had said this is exactly how it happened, it's just too far-fetched to really believe it. Well, we're going to hear what happens next. Anthony is going to come and read to us Ezra chapter 1. As he comes up, let me pray for us as we get ready to read this part of history. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word to us. and We thank you for Old Testament history, what it reveals about you. And I pray that in the, in the pages of these events that happened thousands and thousands of years ago, thousands of miles away, to a people so different from us in some ways, that we would see you speaking powerfully to us. Would your spirit open these words as Anthony reads and as we look at them together afterwards. Stir us with a love for you because of who you are and what you've done. And we pray this in your name. So the reading is um, from the book of Ezra, and it's chapter 1. If you wanted to follow in the church Bibles, you can find it on page 473. Or in the spirit of the away day last weekend, page 5. <laughs> no, 473. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfil the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him, and let him go to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbours assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with valuable gifts, in addition to all the free will offerings. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. Cyrus, king of Persia, had been brought by Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. This was the inventory. Gold dishes, 30. Silver dishes, 1,000. Silver pans, 29. Gold bowls, 30. Matching silver bowls, 410. And other articles, 1,000. In all, there were 5,400 articles of gold and of silver. Sheshbazar brought all these along when the exiles came up from Babylon to Jerusalem. Thank you very much, Anthony. You've told me how to say some of those names. It's going to be really helpful later on. Hopefully I'll remember it. <coughs> I wonder what you made of that. I wonder what you made of that. A little inventory of bowls. Trust me, it's going to be great. Well, it turns out there's no coup need, is there? Cyrus doesn't need poisoning. Who in their right mind could have believed that that is how God was going to do it? To be clear, that was exactly as Prophet Jeremiah said it would happen. But I wonder, how are you with the promises God makes to us? When something horrendously tough is going on, in our lives. Sometimes it throws us on to God, doesn't it? But others, it causes them to doubt God. Maybe difficult work situation, loss of someone you love, mental health struggles. Who doesn't have those moments of doubt? What are you doing, God? What are you doing, God? But you see, it's God who moves Cyrus's heart. Did you notice that? Cyrus is not one of God's people. Cyrus is a foreign king, head of a superpower nation of the time most unlikely candidate to want to restore God's people to their home, to want God's temple rebuilt, they could easily have thought. This is the equivalent of God moving the heart of Vladimir Putin. That is, that is the equivalent. You cannot imagine that happening, can you? 
suddenly him repenting, rebuilding Ukraine. That's the equivalent of that. But God laughs at us when we doubt that he can do that kind of thing. When we can doubt his ability to stir the hearts of anyone. Nothing, absolutely nothing impossible for God. Of course, little known to Cyrus was that that, that same God of heaven who was organising all of history, that God was smoothing the way all along for his defeat of Babylon. God smoothed his way to superpowerdom. I don't know if that's a word, but it is now. Superpowerdom because of God, to victory years earlier. Cyrus is only king of a superpower because God let him become that. Nothing, nothing else. So that's exactly as Jeremiah predicted. His plan for Cyrus to release God's people would happen. Reality is, much more significant than Cyrus gaining an empire is his part in freeing Israel's exiles. That is the most significant part of human history in this. Much more significant in big picture terms that he has a part to play in the rebuilding of God's temple. God arranges events all of the time. There is no such thing, by the way, as a coincidence. No such thing. Our first song, in fact, the songs Amy has chosen were absolutely brilliant, all of them, really on the theme. But that first song, exactly that. So what do you think then? Is our world unstable? In a human sense, maybe. This is not a promise that life will always be easy, that we won't suffer, but it is never outside of God's plan. Alec Matir says this, The sovereignty of God is the pillow on which I lay my head at night. That is why you and I need the Old Testament. If you, if you feel a sense of unease about the world, that, that's understandable. But the Old Testament will tell us God is not sleeping. God's not sitting around idle. God's people's destiny always in his safe hands. He's rebuilding his church. That will happen and he'll use whoever he wishes. So that's where we start. God stirs the heart of anyone. Persian King Cyrus was always to be God's agent in building his church. Let's look at those verses again. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with gold, goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Now, before we get too carried away thinking that Cyrus has had an amazing conversion experience to, to, to Israel's God, just a note of caution. Cyrus professed allegiance to Marduk and other gods of Babylon. But at the same time, he was always keen to restore the images of the non-Babylonian gods, now they didn't have images but they had these gold pots and things, always keen to restore the images of, of non-Babylonian gods to their former cities. So where Babylon had taken people away and trashed the temples, he wants to put them back. Okay? So he also repatriated their worshippers, rebuilding their, their temples, their sanctuaries, and that if you, you want to know, you can read about this in the, the Cyrus Cylinder. You need to be able to read the language it's in. And it sets it all out. And that actually is in the, the British Museum. I'm sure Matt Collie will take you on a trip. He's not in at the moment, but he loves going there. So he'll definitely take you if you want. So do you see, he had respect for, for the gods of his subjected peoples. Where their images have been treated as trophies by Nebuchadnezzar, he now restored them to their sacred cities. This isn't likely because he, he was a super moral nice guy, but because he was a god fear. But all possible gods, he feared all the gods. He attributed his military success to appeasing the gods. 
And so he couldn't risk leaving one out, a sort of insurance policy. In fact, he wanted the God of heaven that he mentions in that, in that, in that edict. He wants the God of heaven, in fact, to pray for him to Marduk. That's what's actually going on. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't believe in God, but he wants all bases covered. You see, it wasn't so much that he wasn't worshipping the God of heaven, but rather that Cyrus combined that with the worship of other gods, with idols, do you see? In that, he's probably a bit like you and me, isn't he? Doubtful that um, any of us are worshipping Marduk or Bel or Nebo, the gods of Babylon. If you are, do have a chat with me afterwards. But I suspect that at least part of our likely allegiances might be to the security we believe we get from the small G gods of our age. See, we don't abandon worship of God for idols. Of course we don't do that if we're Christians. But rather, don't we combine worship of God with idols sometimes, any false gods? I'm just going to pick one tiny example. I didn't know Michelle was going to mention this, just where we started this morning. If you're a Christian, how much does the fact that God has chosen you to be adopted as his son or daughter, he's chosen you, adopted you at enormous cost to himself, a privilege beyond our imagination, how much does that feature when you're feeling low, when you're, you're searching for security and worth and love and not getting it from those around you? You are loved by the God of entirety. And yet we can still search for love from those around you, can't we? That fact doesn't exist. I found this from Michael Wilcox. Uh, usefully challenging, it may be challenging to you, it may be water on the duck's back, I don't know, but let's, let's look at it together. The gods have not changed, for human nature has not changed. What does it want? If it is modest, security and comfort and reasonable enjoyment. If ambitious, power and wealth and unbridled self-indulgence. All extremes, oh, they're both extremes, everything in between. In every age, there are forces at work which promise to meet our desires, whether political programmes, economic theories, career options, philosophies, lifestyle options, entertainment programmes. Here is the enemy among us. It's a powerful saying, isn't it? You see, we don't abandon worship of God for idols. Rather, we love a hybrid option. We love a hybrid. All bases covered. Well, that said, Cyrus wants the temple rebuilt, and he wants everyone to support it. Let's look at uh, verse 4. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So just as in Exodus, I don't know if you remember that, that when the Israelites left Egypt, the Egyptians gave them gifts, gold and and precious things to help them on their way, to help them buy a subway on the motorway, whatever it is, whatever it was. It, it was. it was, this time though, it's a requirement of the king. The king is actually telling those who are not God's people to help God's people to go back. They're giving away their wealth to help God's people return to their homeland and rebuild their temple. Not only that, but there were also payments from the royal treasury. In other words, the government gave them grants to head back home. This, that's actually specified in a, a separate document that found its way into, into the royal archives. And it's going to play a vital role when we get to, to chapter 6, so hold that thought. So imagine our task of, of building our church. Now since Jesus came... Building the church, it's not now building, this, this isn't the church, you are the church, but a people. Church building today, of course, is evangelism. Growing the church, the people. How amazed would you be if your non-Christian neighbours, friends around you, work colleagues, they offered you a couple of hundred pounds a month? Hey Jeff, what's the QR code again for your, for your church giving scheme? We'd love to give a couple of hundred quid a month. Help you grow the ministry of all saints. What's that, what's that QR code? 
you'd probably fall off your desk chair, wouldn't you? Jeff, can you just bring it over to me? I, I, I'd love to give a couple hundred quid a month. And then Ali gets a letter from Maidstone Borough Council. Dear Mrs. Ali, she's our administrator, those that don't know. Dear Mrs. Walla Davis, please advise us of the bank details into which we can deposit our annual contribution of £20,000 for your church building mission project. Was is actually laughing at that. Yeah. She used to work for the council. <laughs> then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Nearly 200 years after the great kingdom of Israel had disintegrated, there remains this remnant. And that's enough. He's stirring the hearts again. This time, it's his people he's stirring the hearts of. So God stirs the heart of his people to build his church. The repeat of the phrase from, from verse 1, that's God's point. His point is this is all him. This is all coming from him. He's the one who's planning the rebuild. His plan, all along, he's in charge. There's no question, is it? The most, single most encouraging thing in a fellowship, in a church, is, is a Christian with a passion to see the church grow. Don't you find that? Those among us who just exude that passion to see people come to know the Lord Jesus. People whose heart God is stirring. Recently, we've been running uh, thank you teas at the vicarage for those serving in all saints, in, in some capacity. Some of you may have been to one already or have one to come in the future. And when we have those, we share with one another how we serve. We hear from one another. And you know, that's the single most encouraging thing is when I hear people's passion for it. I'm not going to embarrass anybody by name, but passion to get the music as good as it possibly can be for God. Of course, why shouldn't we? It's for God, isn't it? A passion to get the tech to work as well as it possibly can be. A passion to see the church spotlessly clean so that when a visitor comes in, it speaks volumes for how much we love the Lord Jesus to that visitor. How much God matters to us. Serving God from the heart. A heart stirred to see God's church built up, growing more and more people, encouraging and, in, and being encouraged. Church building, it can be frustrating, it can be exhausting, it can be painful, but it's never anything less than the most rewarding and satisfying way to spend our energies, time, our money. Everyone whose heart God had moved prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Hearts moved to be those who want to see God's church built. Is that you? It's got to be a good prayer to pray either way, hasn't it? Now, you might, let's go back to that, that inventory. We've got to deal with that, haven't we? It does seem, could be forgiven for thinking it's a, a, a slightly less than exciting part of Old Testament history. The loot that Nebuchadnezzar had nicked from the temple. A bit misplaced, you might think, in the midst of, of the excitement of, the, of this amazing turning point in Israel's history. So, let's have a go at it again. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought by Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. This was the invention. Gold dishes, 30. Silver dishes, 1,000. Silver pans, 29. Gold bowls, 30. Matching silver bowls, how many? 410. Other articles, 1,000. In all, there were 5,400 articles of gold and silver. Sheshbazar brought all these along with the exiles, brought all these along when the exiles came up from Babylon to Jerusalem. So why such a detailed inventory? These gold bowls, these silver dishes, every piece, a witness, to God's sovereign care, isn't it? Every piece carefully brought back out into the light. 
all preserved, all carefully logged. Now, presumably, Nebuchadnezzar had made an invention. That's the only way they could have known that, isn't it? Now, it's doubtful it was because he had in mind that someday it all have to be counted back out, out the storage unit, to give back to the, to the Israelites. Probably rather, it was a record of the spoils of war, wasn't it? It was, it was his victory, most likely in his arrogance, most likely so that he could grandstand his power and might. Look at all these bowls I've nicked from the temple, people. Look at the shiny gold, the shiny silver. Little does he know, he's just a pawn in the hands of Almighty God. He's thinking he's grandstanding all he's achieved, not a bit of it. He has no power except that given him by God. Little did he know, he was in fact carefully noting down, not the spoils of victory, but rather evidence that human political kingdoms might come and go. But God's covenantal promise never fails. He's solid. Judah's political kingdom destroyed God's covenant never. Never. These items prove that God doesn't ever forget his covenant promise. Their exile warned about the centuries. Their exile because God's people were so consistently and utterly unfaithful to their God. Their exile never a permanent status. These consecrated items only ever temporarily relocated. God didn't become a God of grace and mercy in the New Testament. God didn't amend his harsh ways, you know, his propensity to smite people in the Old Testament, melting as he got older and it flowed into the New Testament, a kinder and sort of more gentle God. Utter nonsense. A God of mercy, of restoration, of grace, from the very beginning to the very end. Covenant faithfulness. Always faithful to his faithless people. Still true to them. Always keeping his covenant promise. However it might appear to his people at any given time. In fact, he actually shortened the period of the exile. It was supposed to be 70 years. If you look at the dates, just 48 Chopped a bit off, like they're releasing the prisoners at the moment, aren't they? Whilst this counting out of the tableware might seem rather undramatic, it's the final words of this chapter, though, that mark the turning point of history. Do you have a Bible in front of you? If you do, open it. I'm not even going to put it on the screen. It's too good to be on the screen. The final few words of the chapter. The final four last words. It's on page five or four seven three. You see those words? From Babylon to Jerusalem. That ought to be some spine tingling four words. Spine tingling turning point in Israel's history. But like all good Netflix drama series, that's a teaser for the next episode, Ezra chapter 2. So tune in next week. Friends, you and I need the Old Testament. We need this Old Testament history because it's the history of God's hand through time. It tells you about your God. It tells you that one day it sets up what is going to happen. It sets up the day when Jesus Christ hangs on another superpower's cross of execution, the Roman Empire. The culmination of all of these events. Understanding this history, do you see, it makes sense of the cross of Jesus Christ. And it makes it a very, very big deal. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we see in, in these pages, in this Old Testament history, your powerful hand at work. Lord, you do have a sense of humour, for sure, in the way that you use the most unlikely of candidates to be your agent, to do your bidding here on earth. Lord, we see what seems like the impossible, a pagan, hostile, superpower, arrogant king being the one 
that restores your people, restores your temple, commences the rebuilding of your church. Father, I pray that when we are facing some situation that we cannot, in our, in our finite minds, begin to grasp why it's happening as it is, I pray that we would see and remember your hands, your heart stirring, and know that there is always your good purpose behind it. Lord, I pray that as we learn more about you from the pages of the Old Testament, we would be even more bowled over by your love for us in the Lord Jesus. For I pray in Jesus.